come to our last speaker, but certainly not the least for today. Uh, that's uh, Dr. George Westerman. Uh, George is a senior lecturer in MIT Sloan School of Management. He's also a principal research scientist uh, in MIT Workforce Learning and Jamil Work Education Lab. As you know, George is a renowned uh, pioneer of digital transformation. He published a book a few years ago named Leading Digital. Today, he's going to share his latest insights on how to compare, uh, prepare your company uh, for the success in the coming years. I know all, all of you will be interested. Let's welcome George. Thanks, Graham. First presentation in person in 18 months. So I'm glad you could all be here. I'm just delighted to be here. And uh, I'll get out of the way of the microphone because I'm going to drive them crazy with the feedback. Uh, so yeah, as Graham said, I've been doing digital transformation since before it was a thing. Uh, we started talking about it and trying to tell people this was important. And everybody goes, digital transformation, what's that? I mean, what a silly idea. Let me ask you as a group, how many of you would think that digital transformation is now a very important item for your companies? Great. Now let me ask you, how many would say your companies are ready to really do well at, at digital transformation? Okay, great, great. So we got plenty to talk about then, right? Um, uh, over, over the years, we've done a, a lot of research on how to make this thing happen. And what I wanna get, I wanna share just very quickly some of what we learned over 10 years. And I wanna spend most of the presentation talking about what I call the next stage, where we need to go with this and, and make that happen. Uh, so I have the clicker here, let's have fun with this. This is the right clicker, great. Um, you came here because of this, right? Technology is an endless agitator. You're here. This is just such a bleeping cool place. I see things like what Dina's talking about. I'm just like, oh my, I get to work here, you know? It's so very cool. But I do think that conferences like this can give us a bad idea about what it means to really drive innovation and what it means to really drive digital transformation. And why is that? Because technology is just part of the problem. So you all know Moore's Law, right? If you don't know Moore's Law, please leave now. You're at an MIT conference, you need to know it, right? Moore's Law says technology doubles in power every 18, 24 months. The time scale is different for different technologies, but this exponential idea is there. It just keeps accelerating. Uh, I want to give you my law, Westerman's Law, and that's called the first law of digital innovation. Uh, it took me, by the way, a couple of years to get Sloan Management Review to publish this. Uh, they told me I couldn't call it Westerman's Law, I had to call it the first law of digital innovation. But you can call it Westerman's Law if you want. Okay? And uh, it's this, technology changes quickly but organizations change much more slowly. That's the problem. Technology doesn't do anything in companies. You've got to change your company to make it work. Now I've got to caveat that. Technology may make your product work better. But technology is going to make your company work better, you actually have to change your company to work with it. And that's a slow and difficult process. And so what does that mean? It means digital transformation is not, digital is not really the problem, transformation is. And when we are in a technology focused effort like this, it can be easy to forget. And if you are a technology vendor, it can be easy to forget just how hard it is to make change happen in organizations. What we've been doing over the last 10 years is talking about how do you find those opportunities in digital transformation and then how do you drive those opportunities forward for your company. So, uh, you know, we're talking about digital and we're talking about transformation. Uh, I just talked about two things. I'm a management professor. What's the next slide look like? Two things, management professor. It's got to look like that, right? You got the digital stuff on the vertical, you got the horizontal stuff is, uh, is the leadership stuff. You need both. Now in the book, uh, Graham talked about that book, that orange book from 2014. It won some awards, it helped to make some conversations happen. It was a pretty good book. Uh, if you buy it, I make a dollar in royalties, so please buy, give me that extra dollar, okay? But um, we've actually updated it since then, and we've updated what these two dimensions mean a little bit with a recent article. Digital, cap digital capability? 
this is not the wireless or the AI or the Internet of Things or all the things we've been talking about from the technology side for the last two uh, conference here. Uh, it's really how do you make your business work better with that. So you see, it's how do you put these things into customer experience and operations and business models and all of those elements. Okay? The other side, just as important, is this idea, the vision, the engagement, the governance. How do you make the change happen in your organization? Okay? And so we need both. What we find is that the ones at the top right, the digital masters, when we run the numbers controlling for all the right industry variables, we find that the masters are driving 9% more revenue through their capacity than other companies in their industries. 9%, which is pretty good. They're also doing it at a 26% higher margins. So if you are a company with the 10% margins in your business, the masters are running at 12 and a half. And when we're talking half a billion, billion dollar businesses, this is real money. What's interesting, if you get the off diagonals, is you get what you ask for and you miss what you're not looking for. So the ones that are doing a lot of digital, they're innovating, they're innovating really well. They're just not always connecting it together. And as a result, what happens? Well, you, um, you drive more revenue, but you're doing it at a lower profit margin. The other side, the leadership, the ones that really want to clamp it down, they want to just say, hey, you know, um, we don't want to make mistakes here. We don't want to waste money. I actually had a CEO a couple years ago tell me, we wasted so much money on that dot-com thing. I don't want to do that again. And I said, you know, that was 15 years ago. He's like, yeah, I don't want to make that mistake. So sometimes the leadership take it a little too tight on the governance. They get risk averse. What we find is the companies that are better at, on that conservative quadrant, better at leadership, not at digital, they um, have higher profit margins, but they're driving less revenue because they're not innovating. And if you're driving less revenue, how long will that profit margin stay there? Okay. So this is, you know, first five years of research, the book, this is what you got. We updated it last year on that topic. Uh, when we updated it, we were talking about where to look for innovation, where to look for digital opportunities. Customer experience has always been there. You see what this is, and you, know, you, you get this. Design the right experience, use customer intelligence, build an emotional engagement. We can do that. Operations, core process automation and what you do with that. Business models, not only creating that new Uber of your industry, but also improving your business model. Digitize, digitally enhancing it, right? There's a new one though, and that's this idea of, let's see if this works. Oh, it does. Employee experience, okay? This is something we didn't really think about five years ago, and just about every company I know is thinking about it now. Getting the employee experience, paying as much attention to employee experience as they are to customer experience, because your employees, first of all, happy employees make happy customers, number one. Number two, your employees are a wonderful indicator of how well your processes are working. And if things are making your employees miserable, it's likely you need to improve your processes. So employee experience is the next wave here. And I will say the digital platform, that stuff on the bottom, this all rides on that. It's kind of a given, but it's not quite a given. You had Barbara Wixom here earlier talking about data and what you can do with data. Uh, I will say though, in most companies, the, the digital platforms that we're riding on I found, I think, what is the best picture out there of the digital platform in most large companies. Are you ready for it? Is that about what your systems look like and your processes? Okay. If you're there, how are you gonna make anything happen? How are you gonna get a single view of the customer? How are you gonna do a straight through process if it looks like that? Okay. So one of the other things to do in addition to building all the cool digital stuff is to fix the mess that you've got. Okay. And we've got all kinds of groups that can help you do that, um, to help you think through that. Um, but if you don't fix the mess, then you're just adding on top of the mess and creating more mess. Okay. So that, there you go. That's 10 years of research on digital transformation. We're done. Okay? You got it in five minutes. Uh, I want to get now into the next wave. I want to get into where we're going with this. Because the digital is great. The leadership, though, is what's gonna make the transformation happen, it's gonna make you go over. And when we first started talking about leadership, and we still talk about it this way, there are three things you need to do. Set a vision for where you're going. A vision that's different from where you are. And I've said this, I've been quoted on this, but I'll say it again. Uh, this vision really should turn you from a caterpillar into a butterfly. 
but unfortunately, most people are just talking about thinking about being fast caterpillars. Okay? So you want to really provoke your people to be something different, not just the same, but faster. And we know what that means in the digital world. The vision sets the direction. Engaging your people, working with them on your projects, working with them to find the ideas, working with them to make things happen and improve with the customers, that's your engine. It's what moves you forward along. That's how you get going. And last but not least, governance. We think of governance as the brake pedal, but you shouldn't. Governance is really the steering wheel. Okay? To help keep you on course, if it's your brake pedal, there's something wrong. It should be the emergency brake, but you shouldn't have to use it very often. It should be steering you more. How do we share? How do we coordinate? How do we build on each other? Okay? So that's that. We get the, got the two dimensions in there. Now let's get on to the next wave. Okay, you ready for it? The next stage is here. It's all the enabling elements that make it happen. Because up till now, digital transformation has always been about projects. Find the right projects, execute those projects, figure out a direction, execute a portfolio of projects to get there. It's been about making projects happen. Or if you want to think bigger, it's about programs and portfolios. But it's been about executing things that you want to get done. And we need to move on there. We need to build the capability for the organization to transform over and over and over again. Okay? And that capability is certainly on the technology side, linking closer with your IT people, making them more business savvy, you more understanding how to work with them. But these other two are where we need to go. Getting the culture so it's digital ready, so it can innovate at the right speed and in the right way. And then also getting to the point where your people can keep up with the change. I did a lot of research on what jobs are the robots going to eat. The robots aren't eating as many jobs as quickly as we thought. But still, jobs are changing faster than people are able to keep up. And jobs are changing faster than organizations are able to train people. So what I want to do with the rest of the next 20 minutes, the rest of my session, is focus on this, the next wave of digital transformation. The next stage is about people. Yes, we can do the strategy. Yes, we can do the projects. Yes, we can do the governance. How do we get the people ready to make this change? And I'd say there are three things here. One's a mindset. Another is the culture, getting the culture right. And the last is a continuous workforce learning process. And that's inside your company and across companies. Okay. Now, I'm going through this fast. We can certainly talk about this much more over time. But you know, I didn't want to miss the first 10 years of research in case you hadn't seen it before. And those who had seen it, of course, we did it quickly. You've seen some of that before. But I wanted to make sure we had time to get this. I'm going to give you four ideas, five minutes each. Did they ever tell you when you come to MIT, it's like drinking at a fire hose, right? It's just shooting at you and you hope you get some of it in. I'm sending you a fire hose here. But one of these ideas hopefully will resonate and then just you know where to contact me, right? Uh, and then you don't have to buy a book to do it. So mindset, how do we get out of the old mindset into the new mindset? One of the ways that I'm thinking about this right now is rethinking your assumptions. Where are the pre-digital assumptions, or actually the pre-COVID assumptions also, that may not be true anymore, but that everybody in the organization still thinks are? Our customers really value the human touch. I don't know about you, but for 18 months, I haven't wanted to touch anybody. <laughs> they want personal service. They might not want it from a person. I heard a, num I heard a number uh, today. I haven't checked it out. but. For before COVID, we were running about 28% of the economy was digital, of the transactions were digital, and I heard it's 68% now. Now, I, don't quote me on that, because I don't know it to be true, but that's a big jump, and it's kind of believable with what we did in COVID. Now, here's the problem. If the economy has turned that digital, digital works at a different speed. It works in a different way than our old processes do. And so it's not just about selling that way, it's about executing that way. So it's not that they want the human touch, they want personal service. That's different. Um, regulators will never let us do that. If you ever want to kill innovation, you say that. What I would say is next time somebody says that, go ahead and kill them, okay? 
because it's the easiest thing to say, and it's usually wrong. You can work with your regulators to do things, right? The stuff Dina was talking about, she'll have to work with regulators to get that into nursing homes, but she will. They'll make that work, okay? Um, next up, our IT unit can't work at the speed of innovation. You know, we haven't seen a company work well yet to continually transform without involving the IT people. IT people might not lead it. IT people may need to change, but they gotta be part of the story because they manage the spaghetti. People won't pay a full price for a digital version of our experience. I used to believe that, and then I paid $30 to watch Black Widow on my TV set. Things are changing, right? And um, we gotta remember that. If people aren't in the office, they're not, a, we don't even need to mention that, right? Um, our people know how to get the skills they need. It's an assumption that I don't think is true. And here's one that I will never say again. So the first step here on, is mindset. Think about whether you have the dinosaur mindset. Think about whether you've got enough gray hair like me or you're maybe hiding enough gray hair that you think in the old way. And, um, or either you lost all your hair and it's not gray because it's not there anymore. Um, whether you need to rethink and pay attention to that. That's the mindset. Number two though is this. If we talk about my law, Technology changes quickly, organizations change more slowly. Cultures change much more slowly than that. There's an old quote attributed to Peter Drucker. Nobody knows whether he actually said that or not, but that culture eats strategy for lunch. You just try it, the culture will kill you. Right, we talk about organizational antibodies that kill all innovation. So yes, we gotta get the mindset right, but then we need to go one more step, right? Culture is about assumptions, but it's also about values, and it's also about practices. We've talked about assumptions, we need to talk about values and practices. So we went out and did a study a few years, a couple, about two, three years back now, and we um, looked at digital firms and traditional firms, all 300, 300 people and above, so good-sized organizations, right? And we asked them some key things about their culture. And we compared them up, the digital and, the, and the, the traditional. And we found some interesting things. Oh, by the way, it's, this is the article. Uh, I don't make a commission on this, but hey, they like it when you read the articles in Slow Management Review, so it won some awards, so you can read that. Um, a culture shared and mutually reinforcing set of values and practices that enable high performance in the service of innovation and execution. That is your professor definition. Please write that in your notebooks and forget it instantly, okay? Uh, what is culture? Culture is what happens when the boss leaves the room. Culture is how your people behave, how, what they think is the right way to do, how they do or not do progress as you go along, right? And, but the key point is it's about values, it's about practices, it's also about hidden assumptions, about that mindset part. So here's what happened when we compared them up. The blue is traditional organizations, the green is born digital. And what's interesting here is if you look, some of these practices, experimentation, self-organizing, managing by the data, you see a big difference there, right? See the big difference there between the, the green, which is the digitals, and the blue. You kind of expect that, right? The digitals are just better at self-organizing to experiment. They should be. Now, sometimes they lose that over time, but they should be. What's interesting, though, is over here, um, oh, and rules. They're much less about rules than traditional companies are, okay? What's interesting is here, though, these ones in the middle, they're not that different. These are companies reporting on what their cultures look like. They're not that different, but yet they are, okay? So what's the difference? How do we make this work? By the way, we also did this for values, and digital firms are just very different on values than traditional firms are. So what do we do? How do you make your culture right? Number one, you get the values right. Digital companies are about speed. They're not really, they're, they're, they're about always, you know, moving quick. Make mistakes, but that's okay. You know, move fast, break things, fail fast. You've heard these words. They live these words. This is truly part of the value. How many would say speed is a core value of your company? 
Not very many, okay? Next up, they're not really about profit, they're about impact. They're about changing the world. They're about making really big change happen. And they're gonna keep innovating and they're never gonna be satisfied until it happens. Google wants to organize the world's information. Now they wanna make a lot of money on it too, but that's a big thing, right? Why did they call it Amazon? Because they wanted the entire world's economy to flow through there. They think big and then they start to make things happen. Openness. Let's worry about broad sources. Who has the information? Who has the talent? Let's work with them. So you think about the idea of it's talent, not title. Or working with people wherever they are in the company or not in the company outside. You're here at MIT, right? And last is autonomy. Autonomy is about being able to do the right things within swim lanes rather than asking permission. Now, I know a lot of people that say, I would prefer to ask forgiveness instead of asking permission. And that's usually a really, it's a convenient excuse for being unethical. That's not what I'm talking about here. Okay? What I'm talking about is you've got a lot of discretion to do things and you know when you need to pick up and ask somebody else. So let me ask you about these values. How many of you would say that you have all four of these values, their core for your company? One, okay. Two, three, all right, we got a few. It's interesting though, I think you three work together, don't you? Yes. Uh, all four or five of you. So out of these five, only one of them raised their hands. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing too. I'm the HR oh, she's the HR leader, there you go. She has to think happily, right? I got one for you in a minute though, just a second. Um, how many would say three? Three. Two? Ah, Carl and the gang, they're saying they got three. They do actually, they're good. Two and one. Okay, so you got some work to do on values, right? That's from the top, you talk about that. Now practices. Uh, if you're doing this, stop it, right? Just like I said, next time somebody says the regulators won't let you slap them, um, you shouldn't be saying, hey, you're not following the rules. You should find ways to work within the appropriate rules and then if the rules need to be changed, you can get them, right? But don't let the rules stop you. Build this rapid experiment, self-organizing. We know how to do that. It's tough, but we know how to do that. The agile practices that your IT people are doing, the rapid product development pra practices that you know the internet firms are doing, we know how to do that. We just have to, okay? What's interesting here is the integrity, the stability. The things you do to make sure you stay compliant with regulation, the things you do to help your employees have some stability, it doesn't have to hurt you. Just make this as streamlined as possible. And frankly, this is one of the things that the internet firms have to learn. This is how Google gets in trouble with its, women, with its uh, aging workers. This is how Amazon gets in trouble with women. This is how Uber got in trouble with everybody, right? They forget about the integrity and the uh, the stability kinds of things. So just do them, but streamline them. HR person, remember that, right? And number three, think differently about what it means to be customer responsive, right? To go to the rules. You should be leading your customers, not asking what they want. You should be managing by today's results, not this quarter's results. Because if you're managing by this quarter's results, you're already half a quarter behind, okay? So here's the culture. Once again, five minutes on three years of, our, of research and a 20 minute article to read. I just gave you five minutes, okay? So the whole point is you might wanna read the article or call me about it. You don't have to remember all that stuff in there, okay? So with the last five minutes or so, I'm gonna give you the next, next wave. We've talked about transformation, we've talked about the leadership side and how you got to get the culture right, that also all the organizational stuff. But what about the people? How do you get the people ready to change? Okay. How do you take the fear of change away? How do you empower them to make good choices and move in their careers the way that you wanna move? Uh, we have an article, we think about this doing two ways. One is we have an article called the Transformer CLO and this is how you change learning and development in organizations. Learning and development, unfortunately, in most organizations is back in the last century. And if you ask employees, it actually might be in the century before that, okay? 
and we need to make it much more agile, much more fast. Do you want to be a trainer where you just put courses up there and people wait for their courses? Or do you want to be a transformer? Do you want to be a true partner in making this change happen? As a learning and development head, you should make that choice to be a transformer. If you don't want to make that choice, the organization will make that choice for you. Okay? So we need to move that way. And there are three changes happening here. Number one is just the whole idea. You're no longer giving courses. You're helping people develop the capabilities. And you're helping the organization develop the capability. That's a very different mindset, because you are taking responsibility for results in many ways, rather than just taking responsibility to deliver training to people. Okay? And for some people, that's a big change. For others, it's not. But it needs to happen. Number two is the methods. More personalized, atomized, digitized, and optimized. We need to be learning at work the way we learn everything else. I had to replace the headlights on my car because they were all fogged up. I went to YouTube, and five minutes later, I knew how to do that. If it had been inside a company, I, would have got, I probably could have waited three, four months and taken a week-long course to do that. Right? How can we make it more in the moment, learner-centered, available when it's needed? How can it be more peer learning rather than going to classes? This, art, this article can show you that stuff, but that's where we need to go. That also means the unit itself needs to become leaner, more agile, more strategic than it ever was before. So listen, I gave you the, the 10 minutes intro on 10 years. I've given you now some, some time to think about some of the transformations that are the next stage. The mindset, the culture, the internal parts of workforce learning. I want to leave you with one other thought here about where we need to go with this further transformation of workforce learning around the world. Okay? How can we make learning work across organizations? How can we help people, whether they're in organizations or not? How can we help people that are in organizations but their companies don't care about it? How can we help everybody take charge of their careers to put themselves where they need to do? Okay? The way I think about this is really simple. As a world, We've gotten pretty good at global sustainability and climate change. We've put momentum behind it. We've gotten hundreds and thousands of organizations to align behind this problem of global climate change. Now, we're not done yet. But we've developed some really good momentum, and a lot of good things are happening. There's another wave, another wave of global sustainability, and that's personal sustainability. How can we help people have sustainability in their careers, earn a good living, move into things that will continue to give them a good life, living and a good quality life. We haven't done that yet. That's the next wave. We need to do that. And that's what we're going to try to build here in this Jamil World Education Lab where I am. I want to launch the Global Opportunity Initiative. And it's a very simple thing. Let's give people around the world the right skills to the right people in the right way. Let's do it at scale. Okay? Let's give them good advice on what's possible. Did you know accountants make really good cybersecurity analysts? We're laying off a lot of accountants. We're hiring a lot of cybersecurity analysts. Who knew? That's actually a transition they could make if they get the right advice. Okay. Um, learning, let's make the learning something they can consume as they need to, wherever they are, whether they're working or not. And then let's credentialize that. Okay. Put the stuff, the enabling. Now, MIT is not going to do that. If we're lucky, we'll help a million, two, three million people, and that's a lot. But how do we think at the scale of hundreds of millions? MIT is not going to do that, but we can do it as a global movement. And so what we're launching here is the Global Opportunity Initiative. The idea is let's do just like we did for climate change, but we'll do it for personal sustainability. Let's gather together any organization that cares about helping their people move forward in their careers. We're helping people outside companies move forward in their careers. Universities, NGOs, companies. Get them together and let's convene. Let's talk about what we're doing. Each group will make progress in its way. We'll get together and talk about the progress you're making and what you can learn from each other. And MIT can help to make that happen. We can do working groups to solve certain things like credentials or like advice. But the whole point is we're not going to make money on it. We're going to just convene this. We're going to make this movement happen. That's what we're launching. So if you're interested in that, it's easy to join. You're going to benefit in a lot of ways. We'll give you attention. 
on what you are doing. Of course, you'll learn from each other. As a group, we can start to influence institutions in ways we never could before, right? We can build a, a solutions, we can do that. What does it take to join? Easy. Agree to follow the principles. I'll tell you the principles are not hard to follow. Number two, agree to report your progress regularly that you're making so we can all learn from it. Number three, contribute your energy, your talent. And if you got any money, sure, give us the money, but we're not gonna ask you for the money unless you've got it. Let's make this thing happen, okay? So this is launching, we'll do a soft launch around Christmas, we'll do a, a bigger event in the, the spring, and I would love it if some of you could join in this to really make change happen in the world, to help employees get the kind of transformation that they deserve, and to help your employees be ready when you're trying to drive transformation in your company. So, that's it. The next stage of digital transformation is about people. Yes, it's, there's a lot of hard work to do on, on digital and about transformation leadership, but people's the next step. Mindsets, cultures, continuous learning. So if you're interested about any of this stuff, because we went through it quickly, contact me. I'm George W. at MIT.edu. I'd love to work with you on digital transformation. I'd love to work with you on this new global opportunity initiative. Okay. So thank you. So uh, just, should I just read the questions off the board here? What are my thoughts about digital transformation of a university? Ha, 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 ha. No, um, listen, uh, universities are slow. Um, why are we slow? One of the things is we don't really have measures of quality. Number two, we don't really care all that much about profitability, most companies. So when you think about the values and the practices we got, it's hard for the individual workers to, uh, to really buy into that. That's, an ex that's not an excuse, but it is kind of the reality, and we need to change that. One of the things that's fascinating what's happening here at MIT is we really are buying in deeply into this concept of digitally transforming a university. And what do I mean by that? Uh, we were early investors in edX to put courseware out there for free for people around the world to just get the learning they need. We're not gonna make a dime from those people. Now we sometimes charge for us to, to grade your papers, but we're not actually making much money on that either. It's just you know, to, to say, hey, are you serious or not? We're gonna charge you 100 bucks. That was the start. Then you see what happened in our, our um, executive education. We were getting into digital learning and high quality digital asynchronous learning before COVID happened. So when COVID happened, we were ready for it. Now what we're doing with this global opportunity in, in, in index uh, in, initiative with some work we're doing on blockchain transcripts with some other things, we're getting in a situation where we can take the learning apart and you can put it together through your own wallet as opposed to us doing it for you. So at least at MIT and some of the top schools around the world, it's happening. The challenge is though, like I said, we don't have that external pressure and we don't have that profit motive. So it can be a little tricky unless you've got some good leadership to make it happen. Okay. Three good references for to eventually turn around from di traditional digitally transformed. Listen, I, you know, basically anybody in CPG is doing a great job of it. Finance is doing a great job of it. ING Bank you hear a lot about, but they're not the only bank that's doing this well. Uh, so, you know, I've, see, I've seen it in mining with what Rio Tinto is doing. I've seen it, my very favorite company, they're not Fortune 500, but anybody from India, do you know a company called Asian Paints? Anybody? If you grew up in India, you know this company. And if you grew up in India, you know what Asian Paints has done over the last 10, 12 years. They've gone from being making and selling paint 13 different ways in 13 regions of India, to being an integrated seller of paint, painting services and home renovation services in 17 countries. For a company that sells paint, right? Uh, so certainly finance has been doing it for a while, especially consumer-facing finance. Um, retail's been doing it for a while. Most, there's a lot of good, there are a lot of good examples in those industries. In the B2B world, it's been a little slower, but companies like Schneider Electric and others, in the B2B world, it's happening too. Okay. Uh, let's see. Organization responsible for people aspect of mindset and continuous learning, is it HR, which is often highly centralized, or individual assumptions like sales and support? Listen, it's very easy to say, hey, it's everybody's job. If it's everybody's job, it's not gonna happen. So we need to have somebody help to drive this. And we see it driven from a couple places. Certainly I've seen it driven from HR, 
when HR is in a position to make this happen, when HR is respected, when it is, has the ear of the right people to make some of these changes happen. Otherwise, we'll see it happen in units and then expand beyond there, right? Certainly at Microsoft, the culture change was led from HR and worked really tremendously well. I've also seen HR doing this in a large, I don't know whether they're Fortune 500, but one of the world's largest appliance manufacturers, it's being led by HR to make it happen. So if HR is in position to do it, yes. If not, somebody else needs to do it with HR's help. But somebody's got to be in charge. This idea that everybody's in charge is silly. Um, can you give a more concrete example of how best in company manages their employees' learning in digital tech and DNA space? What's DNA? Data analytics. Data analytics. Okay, great. So um, I'm just trying to think of which ones to give you with just a minute or two. Um, look up DBS Bank in Singapore. Uh, DBS Bank, the joke used to be that DBS stands for damn bloody slow. And they went from being the worst in their industry to the best in their industry by becoming a 22,000 person startup. And what they did, the article will talk about it, but others will do it. What they did is they said, listen, let's let everybody care about this first. Let's help them understand how digital matters for them. And let's make it easy. They had learning days taught by peers, not by instructors. Each job, you'd understand competencies you require for that job, and you can either go get digital learning or you can go to workshops that are offered in that world. They made the peer learning interesting because in addition to, if you were a peer learner, not only did you get to peer, be a peer learner, but you also then got to advance faster if you're that person. So that's one way to do it. Another way I saw that was really fascinating uh, was uh, Fidelity, in, Fidelity Investments. Their call center reps have to, they have to have some real knowledge because they're giving advice. And what they do is fascinating. In the morning, you learn about a new product. In the afternoon, you go on the switchboard and calls about that product come to you. And you answer them with somebody who's sitting at your, at your side. And the next morning, you come back and say, hey, how was that experience? What worked, what didn't, how can we make it work? So we, we talk about instruction and introspection and immersion. You need all three. Let's not just shout at you. You need to think about what it means for you, and then you need to practice it, and then we need to repeat that cycle. Fidelity does that in a day and a half, teaching these call center reps to do it. So th those, are, those are some of the ideas that are out there. Uh, one company has a pin board. They have, in essence, every topic out there has a Pinterest on it. So if you need to come up to speed in 10 minutes on the quickest articles on DNA, you go to the pin board, and it's there. Or what the heck is an NFT? There's a pin board for it self-curated by the workers. So there are many opportunities. You can see more of them in the article. Okay. How do we extend this philosophy of digital transformation beyond the workforce into the classrooms to get the next generation ready? Uh, do I have a slide on this? Let me see. Um, number one, we gotta change the teachers. We gotta get rid of those professors I had that said, listen, um, school is about learning, not careers. When you're paying $50,000 a year, it better be about both. Right? Number, so one of the things we need to do is we need to change the people giving the advice to help them think a little bit more about this. Number two, we need to help people get what I call human skills. Uh, we can't call them soft skills because this is MIT. And you know, you call it soft skills, MIT doesn't do anything soft. Okay? But let me see if I have this slide. It's hidden. Um, ah! See that thing at the right there? Ah! Oh, come back. There we go. See that thing there? Somebody made the mistake of asking me, hey, George, you know, uh, what, what, are soft, what are soft skills? And I asked one of my RAs, give me, the, give me the, an example of soft skills. And she found six of them. And I said, really, you found six of them in like a couple hours. How many are there? We found 41 different frameworks of soft skills. And so we came up with our, our framework of human skills. So if you, if you want to think it's ironic that MIT is talking about human skills, you can go ahead and think it's ironic, that's fine. I thought it was kind of funny. But um, the way we think about it is we, we did some really good rigorous stuff to combine frameworks and to grow the frameworks, but the way to think about this is at the meta level. These are the skills to help you thrive in the, in the, the coming economy. And what you don't see there is math or calculus or English composition. What you do see is different ways to think about human skills. And I'm sorry this is small, 
The way to think about this is the top row is how, what I do, the bottom row is what I manage, the left is me, and the right is other people. How do I think? It's not only, it's critical thinking, but it's also systems thinking. It's also comfort with ambiguity. How do I manage myself? Yes, it, there's planning, but there's also self-awareness. There's also initiative. How do I interact with others? How do I lead? Okay. So can we get these into the classroom? We're building curriculum right now for advanced manufacturing training to help people go from starting at 15 an hour to help them starting at 25 an hour. One of the things we're doing is we're building these, some of these, into that curriculum. So they not only learn how to run a 3D printer, but they learn critical thinking and troubleshooting to just be able to do that next piece, to be ready for that next step in their careers. So it was a long answer to how do we help teachers, help students get ready? Number one, the teachers need a different mindset. And number two, we need to go to these higher order human skills, not just the technical things we've been teaching until now. Okay, last one. Giant organizational barriers, fear, fear of losing jobs, roles, power at all levels of an enterprise. Yeah, um, it's fear. So how do you do this? Uh, you gotta just paint a picture that where we're going is better than where we are. And so there's the, the, the often used idea of the burning ship or the burning platform. If you can make that case, right, that we're gonna sink otherwise, so you gotta get there, that can help. If you're performing well, that's a little trickier and you need to paint a picture of how you're gonna be better or how you're gonna avoid the burning platform. And in the jobs and the roles and the power, it's gonna happen anytime you're driving a change. And there are three ways to overcome that. At least what we teach at MIT, there are three ways to overcome that. One is the rational story. Tell the story and some people will believe that story is true. Hear how the numbers work, the spreadsheets, the business model, all that kind of stuff. Some people believe that. Other people, it's about culture. Change, this is, it's the right way to go or it's not the wrong way to go. And, and when you're running counter, when people say that's just not how we do things, you gotta overcome that. And number three is just use the power. Swing a very large baseball bat. And you know exactly what I mean. And so different people respond to different, one, they think about the world through different lenses here and they respond through different lenses. Um, but that's a hard problem. Uh, one way I could say it is that leaders don't actually do things in organizations. Even Carl doesn't actually do anything in organizations, right? Leaders get other people to do things. And getting them to do something when they're not sure they want to do it, that's a really hard job. But it's one of the big tricks to make this happen. Okay? This is your last conference. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Uh, you know where to find me, George Westerman, georgew at mit.edu.